welcome back to the first part of our four-part series on the cryptocurrency journey. It's technically the second part, I guess. If you've watched the overview, I appreciate it. If you haven't, please go back and watch the overview. It'll really give you kind of a macroeconomic understanding of what's going on and why we are even at this point of you entering crypto or trying to understand crypto because it gives you a more macroeconomic and general overview of, of what's going on. So before we get started, I do have to do this little piece. This content is for informational purposes only. I'm not a financial advisor, and you should not construe any information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. This is just my opinion. Please do your own research on everything and do not simply make decisions on what you've heard here. And that part is honestly, I'm serious. In it, the best advice I can give you in, in this whole crypto thing is always do your own research, always learn about everything. Um, if it feels like there's too many things to learn about, pick just a few. That's another piece that we're going to be kind of defining in this in this series of, you know, which ones you pick, how do you research it, how do you focus on those things. But please always learn about everything that you're doing. You never want to invest in anything that you don't know. So to that effect, this this set of talks is going to be have four parts. First part is going to be us understanding the different industries effectively or different sections of the crypto sphere today, or at least even the hard, hottest topics today. Um, then we're going to be looking at each one of the cryptos, giving a bit of an overview of the top 20 or my favorite top 20 that I've done the research on. Because again, I would only talk about the things I've done the research on. There's too many to know. So I can't say I know everything about everything. And the second piece is going to be us um, defining how to enter the crypto market, because that tends to be a really scary part of this whole journey of like, how do I even get in? The third part is going to be how to stay in there how to not make common mistakes while you're in the crypto investment journey. And then fourth part is going to be, how do I get out? What's my exit strategy, right? So that all together should give you a good good overview, good understanding of what's required for you to go through this whole journey. And after that, we'll be defining a lot of different pieces, but that's what we're going to be doing here. So just to give you a little bit of a background on myself, I... I studied in electronics engineering as well as a bachelor's in um, communications and culture with a focus on science, technology, and society. And I feel like that really helped me in the in the crypto sphere because I, I really got to understand the idea of blockchain from its basic principles, from its fundamentals in 2012. Because I'd heard about this thing around 2010-ish, didn't really pay too much attention to it. Around 2012, I, there was a lot of hype about it. So I really started to pay attention and started to read about what is blockchain, what is the benefits of it. And as soon as I saw it, I realized, wait, this is a new way to do the internet. This is completely revolutionizing the idea of the internet. And and even more than that, it's actually revolutionizing not even more than that, but further from that, I realized it's revolutionizing the idea of money and banking. So it's like a, it's like even better than just revolutionizing the internet. And from that point onwards, from about 2012, I, I started doing my research. I watched that market cycle very closely. At that time, it was that we had no previous data. It was crazy. You know, we went from a few dollars to eleven hundred dollars for the price of Bitcoin, and then we went back down to like a, a few hundred dollars or a couple hundred dollars. And that was really exciting because that was the first time that I, I'd, I'd ever seen that. And it was such a such a fresh, new, nascent technology that, that it was kind of mind-blowing to see that this, if this is the new internet, that it's going through this birthing phase. And then next time around, um, in 2017... I, because I'd already kind of seen one of the cycles, I had decided. I decided the next time this thing happens, I am going to invest some money into it. But again, I didn't. I didn't trust it enough because I was like, "Wait, if this is a new way of doing money, guess what? The governments are going to do. They're going to shut it down. 
they're not just going to let us make a new new money and not do anything about that. But they didn't. They didn't shut it down. And the same thing happened again, where it went from a couple hundred dollars. Um, it, it actually so so it actually went from a couple hundred dollars all the way up to twenty thousand dollars. And and during that cycle, I put in like twelve hundred bucks in there. It turned into twenty four hundred. I didn't know what I was doing, so I pulled out my twenty four hundred, and then it it ran well beyond that point. Um, but I dipped my toes in there, and I got and I understood. Okay, wait, this cycle was very similar to the last one. Very similar. It, they were, it was an uncanny resemblance between the two, and it acted the same way. At that point, I had already started doing a lot of kind of. I'd been doing macroeconomic studies from 2008 because once the 2008 crash happened, I realized something is off. They're telling us one story in, in, in business school and in school in general, but they're telling us another story. Uh, in, when you actually do the research, you find out another story of how the world works and how money works and how everything is manipulated in this way. And then that kind of tied back into my communications of culture background because I studied about how science and technology affect society and how mass communication and and effectively propaganda is used to to cause the effect that science and technology have on society and really direct the mindset of society. So I had already started to realize that the 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 traditional markets, the the housing market, the derivatives market, the stock markets, the bond markets, all of these had been manipulated in ways and inflated in ways where the markets needed to correct themselves. The markets needed to come back down because they were inflated into bubbles and they were supposed to ha- that was supposed to happen in 2008, but they didn't let that happen. They actually started printing money at that point to try to cause economic activity to, to keep the economy from collapsing completely. So I, you know, after having done enough of my research, I realized, well, that collapse has to happen at some time. Time. Not even a collapse. That reset has to happen sometimes. You, when you have a boom, there has to be a bit of a bust for the market to reset and then have another boom. And in 2017, I realized, wait, so this crypto thing seems like it's, it's tied to this whole idea of the other markets resetting. Because when you ran the analytics of of the of the eight year cycles of these market crashes, so it was like you know nineteen ninety nine, then around two thousand eight, then the next one was supposed to happen twenty sixteen, which they didn't let happen, but the 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 peak of the uh, the crypto cycle happened end of twenty seventeen, so I was I was starting to see some kind of a correlation there. I had been through. Now, two market cycles of Bitcoin, I realized they're very correlated. I started to learn about what makes them so correlated. Why are they so predictable? And that really then lent itself to me having a lot of revelations, which I'm going to be sharing with you, that really helped me understand the bigger picture of what's going on and why it's going on. And that then, of course, led, 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 led me into... La, 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 la. It led me into doing the research on the various different cryptos and like what do they actually do what are their fundamental use cases because i always want to come from a place of because as a you know as i learn more about investment i realize we invest in something because we believe that it's going to generate value for society going back to that same piece that we talked about in the last talk that the value that some company or some person generates in society is equivalent to the amount of value that society is willing to pay them. A stock or uh, an investment in anything is you saying, okay, I believe this thing I'm investing in is going to add a lot of value to society and I'm willing to put my money in it today so that later on once the value has been added or it's added Const- is ad- constantly adding more value to society, I, my, my investment will grow. That's what investing is. So you invest in value. You invest in the fundamental idea of how much value is there for society in this thing. When you look at it like that, blockchain has insane potential. So, so let's actually look at the different kind of 
hot use cases of blockchain right now? Just to give you a little bit more detailed view of that overview that we've already looked at. So we know the most talked about and known and best use case of blockchain is Bitcoin. What value does Bitcoin add to society? What is its, its use case? It's, it's easy to think about it as digital gold. You know, It is a store of value, just like gold. It is trusted because it has a lot of properties that gold has. So for example, why do we trust gold? We trust gold, number one, because it's been trusted for a long time. It has time behind it, okay? That one Bitcoin doesn't have. But secondly, gold is rare. It's produced in a limited supply. It is divisible. It does not get destructed. It, it lasts a very, very long time, ideally an infinite amount of time. It is agreed upon to be a store of value across the world. So we've all agreed that we trust it to be a store of value. It can be moved. It can be divided. So th those are kind of the general reasons why we see gold as this value, because it's rare, it's limited, it can be divided, it can be traded. It's a good store of value. I can put a lot of monetary energy, purchasing power into a small little space. Bitcoin does that almost completely better than gold. Sure, it doesn't have that much time behind it, but it does have 10 years behind it. Over the past 10 years, over $1 trillion of monetary energy has been put into it. Gold has about $10 trillion, so Bitcoin isn't that far away from reaching gold's level. And I believe, again, not financial advice, but I believe that Bitcoin is going to go well past gold's value. So Bitcoin is rare. Bitcoin, because it's rare because only 21 million will ever be produced and 18 point something million is already in, I think it's 18.6 million, is already existing in the world. So it's rare, just like gold. It is produced, so gold is produced at a limited rate, right? So we have very small amounts of gold being mined all over the world. But as the demand for gold goes up, the supply goes up, excuse me, as the demand for gold goes up, then the price of gold goes up, therefore the miners mine more gold. So the, the supply does follow the demand. With Bitcoin, the mathematical code that runs Bitcoin is set up so that actually every four years, half the Bitcoin is produced. So even when the demand goes up, the supply keeps going down. Okay, so in that way, it's better than gold. Isn't it more rare than gold? Because you can make more gold, but you can't make more Bitcoin. Actually, less and less Bitcoin are produced. And what happens to things that become more and more rare? They become more and more valuable. That should explain to you why Bitcoin keeps going to these ridiculous numbers, you know, from eight-tenths of a penny to dollars, from dollars to $1,100, from $1,100 to $20,000, from $20,000 to the hundreds of thousands of dollars it's going to go to this cycle at the peak. So it's, it's, it's rare. It's produced in limited supply, actually a reducing supply. It can be stored for an infinite amount of time. It can be divided better than gold, technically. It can be divided a million times over. It can be transported way easier than gold, actually. I can send it across the world effectively for free. Can't do that with your gold. It can store a ton of value inside it, actually way more value than gold. It takes up no space. I can't even put up, I can't take a million dollars of gold in my pocket. One, because somebody would take it from me. But secondly, it's, gold has mass. Bitcoin has zero mass. So it can be, I can store as much of it as I like in my pocket. Somebody can't take it from me. You know, a gold, if you put it in your, in your bank, the bank could take it from you. The government could go to the vault and take it. In 1973, I believe it was, the U.S. government just said, we were, we're going to confiscate all of the gold that you have. Bring it into us. Otherwise, you'll get arrested. Bitcoin, they can't do that. They can't take it from you. It's not kept in a, in a vault. Okay, so then there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that it's better than gold. Okay. But it's basically is doing the value it's adding to the world, going back to that principle, the value it's adding to the world is that it allows us to store monetary energy, a lot of it, in a better way than gold. That is a great use case. Gold is valuable. 
So if something does gold's job better than gold, then that's valuable. That's why Bitcoin is valuable. That's why, and uh, like not even not even considering the trust factor. I mean, like why do we trust money? It's because we trust it. It's just paper. It's paper with ink on it. It's completely worthless. It's not even backed by gold. Yet we trust it. Therefore, it is valuable. With Bitcoin, same thing. We trust the code. We trust that the code is not going to steal from us. The code is not not it can't it's not controlled by a government. It's not controlled by a bank. They can't just print it out of thin air. There's a trillion dollars of trust behind it, so that increases the level of trust. But that trust is worth its weight in gold. Pun intended. So that's what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is is a way of storing value. And it does gold job better. That one we, you know, you've probably all heard of. Another kind of hot sector of of blockchain and of the Bitcoin industry is you might have heard like ICOs. That's what was hot in 2017. But the idea is that. You know, we talked about how Ethereum, if you haven't watched the previous talk, again, I recommend watching it, but I'll give you a little overview again. So if we know that, you know, blockchain, the idea of blockchain is basically just a ledger, a accounting book, basically, that allows transactions to be kept recorded on some kind of a ledger inside of a computer. And we know that Ethereum is basically that exact same ledger with a little computer attached to it that allows me to be able to program different things into that computer that will automatically, it'll change the ledger automatically every time I need something done. Then there are many, many different use cases that you can build into that computer, right? Like just like a computer can run many different programs and many different websites that all do different things and all of them, each one of them adds value to society. In the same way, Ethereum is a is a basic computer that allows us to build many, many, many different programs that add their own set of values to society. Now, that's not just Ethereum. Ethereum is the is like a basic computer that's attached to that ledger that allows us to build a bunch of apps that can do all variety of things. Cardano is another one that that Cardano is like a, a like a better, smarter computer that's hooked up to that ledger. It's not the same ledger. Cardano has its own ledger. Like it's like Cardano has its own accounting book. Um, Ethereum has its own accounting book. But the, the idea is they had that Ethereum is a basic computer that's attached to that book. Cardano is a better computer that's attached to that book. Polkadot, Solana, they have their own way of setting up a computer that you can build apps on top of. So there, there are these platforms that will allow many, many different use cases to be built on the platform. So it's kind of like, you know, there are different internets that allow many different use cases to be built on there. So that's another concept that is that is really developing into a, a very important piece of the blockchain sphere. So a lot of the coins that are that are existent today, they all do, you know, different variety of things, but many of them are built on Ethereum. A lot of the coins are built on Ethereum. So Ethereum is like the internet, is like the computer system that it's built on, and then each one of those coins is like an app or a website that does a certain thing. One of them maybe allows you to exchange derivatives. One of them allows you to be able to create tokens to be able to tokenize real estate, so on and so forth. But there's a lot of apps, and and they're called dApps, decentralized apps effectively, that are being built on these blockchains like uh, Ethereum, Cardano, Polkadot, Solana, and many, many others. So that's another area of this blockchain sphere. Now, the last two that I want to discuss are DeFi. If you've heard about DeFi, here's what it is. The most amount of money in the world exists in finance, centralized finance, okay? So Part of me if some of these figures aren't exactly dead on, but as far as I remember, there's about $200 trillion of value in real estate. There's about $150 trillion of value in cash, which is money. There's about, I believe, $200 trillion of value in stocks and a couple hundred trillion, I think, in bonds, okay? 
And those are the traditional places that we keep our money. There is $1,000 trillion of nominal value that's in a financial product called derivatives. They don't even exist. They effectively don't add the traditional mode of value that we think about, yet they alone are holding more value than real estate, stocks, bonds, money, all the money in the world combined. So that should tell you that financial products, the finance world, holds more value than the entire world combined. And of course, stocks, bonds, they, they're actually financial. They're, they're part of the financial world. They're finance, right? That's what we mean when we say finance. Now, that finance is centralized finance. It's run by banks and then hedge funds and insurance companies and organizations that are all centralized. You know, your JP Morgans, your BlackRock, your Chase, your you name it. That's who, that's who we, your, your Goldman Sachs, that's who we know as centralized finance. But And you probably heard about the fiasco with Robin Hood, um, with GameStop, um, GameStop, not GameStop, stock of GameStop. Um, all those kind of things are happening in the central finance world. And what what is that world? That world was built in a way so like if you or I wanted to invest in that world, you have to jump through many, many regulatory hoops. You have to become a accredited investor for a lot of the investments. You have to follow regulations you have to have a financial advisor to even do it for you so you know if if you have stock investments and and any kind of larger investments you would understand the complexity involved in that whole process it's almost turned into this game which the average person doesn't even understand and doesn't understand how to play and therefore the average person gets taken advantage of that's how many people who lost their investments and their then their and their their, their hard-earned money in 2008 and even before that, they lost it in, in a world of centralized finance where it's, it's, it's the big boys club. It's kept away from the average person. Somebody in the middle of Africa can't invest in that. They legally just can't. They have no means of doing that. DeFi is blockchain's answer to that. It's the crypto world's answer to that. It's decentralized finance. What it, what it means is it's the same stuff that they do you know, it's the ability to be able to invest. It's the ability to be able to have derivatives. It's the ability to be able to borrow, to have insurance. All the same functionalities that exist in the centralized finance world are now being made available to this decentralized finance world. Remember, decentralized just means it's not done on a, a computer that some big corporation owns. It's actually done on little computers that are run by us at our own houses where we're, you know, we're, we're running a Ethereum mining rig and that same service becomes available to us without having to rely on a centralized organization and that the guy in the middle of Indonesia and the guy in the middle of Africa and the guy in the middle of India who was never allowed to um, transact in that internet of value or that, not even internet, that, that world of value that is centralized finance and they were kept outside of that now has access to actually be able to invest and grow their assets and participate in the world of finance. So that's what DeFi is. Whenever you hear DeFi, that just means decentralized finance. It, what that means is being able to do a lot of the things that finance has been doing in the traditional world, but in the crypto world where it's more fair, less regulated, um, just generally more open to the world itself. So that's, that's one really hot topic. The final one I want to talk about, you probably heard about this one, is NFTs, non-fungible tokens, okay? Non-fungible tokens. So, so if you think about it, Bitcoin, there's 21 million of them. I can exchange one Bitcoin for another. There's nothing unique about each Bitcoin. And the point is to use it kind of like a money. You know, even when even all the other tokens, you know that if you if you follow through from the beginning, you know that those tokens are ways for you to pay for work that's done on the network. You know, if you have Ethereum, I actually use it to be able to pay for the work I'm doing on the Ethereum network, which is a bunch of computers that are running. So if they do work for me, I pay them in Ethereum. So those are, excuse me, all ways 
for me to be able to transact value. And one Ethereum is no different from another Ethereum or Ether, technically. One Ether token is no different from another Ether token. NFTs is a little bit different way of doing things. What an NFT is, it's a unique token that is, each token is unique per se, and it's being used for really novel use cases. So it says, if I own an, a non-fungible token, an NFT, it proves that I have exclusive usage rights of whatever that token is attached to, right? So, so it's being used for art, where an artist releases art, and, you know, you are an art collector, you like having the original art pieces from this artist, so you buy this token from them along with the art, and this token proves that you are the original owner. And remember, because this is all run on a public ledger, remember that piece of paper that nobody can mess with, that, that is trusted to have the truth written on it, that's our, our blockchain ledger. On that ledger, it says you own it. So your ownership is proven undeniably with the, with the ownership of that token. That's one way of using it. And remember, that one token isn't like every other token. You know, just like... Like, even though one Bitcoin is like every other Bitcoin, so you could have each one and it doesn't make a difference. In this case, this token is like, I own a Picasso. This token is, I own a uh, Beeple. So I can own all of these collectibles through NFTs. And that token shows gives you uh, user rights or like uh, is ownership rights, basically, proof of ownership. But there's a few other ways of doing it, like some football or soccer, wherever you are in the world, um, teams have started offering NFTs as crowdsourcing money. So you buy an NFT that crowd that sends that's basically crowdsourcing money for the team, but then that team gives you a little bit of voting rights. So like which jersey should be where? If you're one of the token holders, you have a unique token showing you that you own a piece of the decision making of the team. Then when they want to decide on jerseys, you get to vote, and you can show your ownership and your voting rights using this token so the the reason why i'm telling you about all these things is because when you are investing in cryptocurrency you have to understand these fundamental use cases that are really becoming the hot topic because what what happens in these markets is that you know the very the very first market cycle bitcoin was the hottest topic you know just the idea of being able to digitally store value was the hottest topic. And that's why Bitcoin blew up through the roof and it went from, you know, cents to a dollar. And then it went from a dollar to, to $1,100. And then the last market cycle, ICOs were a really hot topic, which was, you know, Ethereum had released way before that. And Ethereum gave the, gave the ability, because Ethereum is this open ledger with a computer attached to it where you can build whatever use case you like. Ethereum gave the ability for anybody to be able to build all the coins. And so last, last cycle, that was the hot topic, that you can build all these new use cases and coins. So a lot of people invested their money into these ICOs and all that stuff. So that, the, a lot of the money flowed into ICOs because that was the hot topic. This time around, there's two hot topics, two of the hottest topics is the DeFi, decentralized finance, because there's a lot of excitement about being able to do what the financial world has done, but in this decentralized manner and the benefits that it creates, because, you know, like I said, it's more fair, it's less manipulated, and it's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are, that are better. So, and, and then NFTs is, is the last kind of hot topic this time around. And because DeFi and NFTs are the hot topics, they're going to get a lot of a lot of monetary energy that's going to be put into it because people are investing in these fundamental use cases which make a lot of sense to invest in. Now, before we go into this list of all the cryptos and me just kind of droning on about what each one is and trying to give, get you to understand what it is, here's one thing I want you to understand. There are at the time of this recording, around 9,000 cryptocurrencies that are created. Because, I mean, anybody can just make one, right? I can just make one. You can just make one. A lot of these are open source. So you just, I can make a SIM coin and tell you, hey, SIM coin has value. Give me a bunch of money. And then just run away with that money. 
That happens regularly in this industry. So when you hear about all these new projects and all this stuff and you want to invest in it and you don't know what you're talking about, you haven't done your research, remember that there are a lot of scams in this world. A lot of scams. This is a completely unregulated market. So when you're investing your hard-earned money, make sure you've actually done your due diligence to make sure it's not a scam. That's why I'm only going to be talking about the the so-called blue chip coins that I've done research on that have been there for a long time, that have fundamental use cases, that really have proven to me, okay, these are not scams. These are not just hype projects. These are things that I want to invest in long term because I know that they have fundamental value behind them. You could There's 9,000 places to invest, and a lot of them will probably try to, try to scam you out of your money. Just a little disclaimer. Make sure you know this. I'm not. I'm not here to tell you everything is great, and this you'll just. This is just some magic, fairy world of being able to buy Lambos and fly to the moon and all that. Right? No. So let's really get into the details of understanding. Now that you understand the general sphere of, of the different kind of major use cases of the, the major hot use cases of uh, cryptocurrencies. Now let's really get into what each one is because. You, now you understand what blockchain is. Now you understand what the different different uh, kind of industries in there are. So let's start with the big kahuna, Bitcoin. Good old Bitcoin. What is it? What does it do? All Bitcoin does, and it does it really well, it stores value. That's it. It's like gold. What does gold do? I don't know. It just, I just hold it, right? So you keep it or something? Yeah. Gold just stores value. Other than that, it's a problem to store. It's a problem to hold. It's heavy. It's, it's literally just a store of value. It's, it's, it's your ability. It's the ability to take a bunch of monetary energy, like we've been talking about, and take that purchasing power that that energy can create and store that in a physical sense in something that will hold that monetary energy and power until a later time when you need to release that energy or uh, that monetary energy and use that purchasing power to create some work or create some product right that's what gold does that's what bitcoin does bitcoin simply just holds monetary energy and purchasing power so that it doesn't get diminished over the time that you're holding it other than that, nothing else. That's why people, when people say, well, I can't buy coffee with my Bitcoin. And it's like, yeah, you can't buy coffee with your gold brick either. But that doesn't make the gold brick any less valuable. Right? I hope that made sense. Number two, Ethereum. What is Ethereum? So if Bitcoin and blockchain are just, there's, it's just a ledger of accounts and it allows you to be able to track who has how much and allows you to be able to uh, able to track uh, transactions then ethereum is like that same ledger that same piece of paper the idea the, the same blockchain backing basis the same basics that are backing blockchain but with a little computer attached to the front so that computer allows you to be able to automate things to happen on that ledger so you can automate different functionalities into that computer, and it, it'll change that ledger automatically for you. It'll change that accounting book automatically for you. Now, that's really useful because then you can build all those apps that we talked about to run on that computer and be able to use the Internet in a new way. And all Ethereum is technically is a computer system that's being run across the world. That instead of Google running computers, it's people who are running their Ethereum nodes, and they are running the computer saying, hey, if you want something done, I got my computer running for you. I paid for the computer. Please build something so you can do some work using my computer instead of using Google's computer. And when you do that, you pay them in Ethereum. So it's a new way of doing the internet. It's a virtual machine, a virtual computer that allows you to do whatever you like on it without having to use Amazon Web Services. The third one, Binance Coin. So when you're looking at cryptocurrencies, one of the things I constantly hear is, 
but they're not backed by anything. But they're not backed by anything. Like, what is Bitcoin backed by? So to answer your question, Bitcoin is backed by trust, human trust. It's backed by the trillion dollars of monetary energy that's in there. It's backed by the trust that we have. The trust is is in the um, the the immutability of the code because we trust code more than we trust banks and governments. So it has trust. That's all it does. Ethereum is backed by the computer network that it's running. It's a bunch of computers. That network does work and adds value. So that value is what Ethereum is backed by. You can use it to do whatever you like. Binance coin is a little different. Binance coin is a coin created by the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in the world, Binance, to be able to transact in their ecosystem. So the value of Binance coin is actually asset-based. It's asset backed is backed by the value of the exchange the binance exchange is backed by all of the assets the binance exchange holds which is all the cryptocurrencies and buildings and all the other things binance owns it's backed by all the money that binance makes and customer base that binance has so binance coin is actually the the top asset backed coin that there is that actually has physical hard assets behind it if you don't consider Bitcoin to be a hard asset, which I kind of do. So that's what Binance is, Binance Coin. Fourth one is Tether. This one gets a little a little confusing for people sometimes, but it's a very simple concept. It's as if it's basically a ledger, an accounting book that we talked about. And it's an accounting book that when when you put in dollars, it converts it into digital dollars. That's all it is. It's a digital token representing exactly the value. I keep burping, sorry. I'm sorry if you heard that. That was very rude. Apologies. Really apologies. So it, it is backed. It, it's a token that is it, that stays the same value as a dollar. You know. So if you take your money and you want to put it in, but you're like, I don't know where to put it, but I need to convert my U.S. dollars into, the, into this cryptoverse and need to hold it before I send it somewhere, you would keep it in US te- USD Tether. Now... Quick little warning with Tether, they're, when you actually look into the fundamentals of how they're doing things, there seems like there isn't, there is some, some non-kosher practices as far as the issuance of Tether. Because remember, one of the problems with the U.S. dollars is, is that they're not backed by anything and they keep printing them out of thin air. It seems like Tether might be doing something similar, so make sure you look into that. Just a little warning. You don't want to hold your holdings in Tether. You can use it as transitory for taking your money, converting it into Tether so that you can convert into the different things, but you don't want to hold your holdings in there because they have a a lawsuit against them and so on and so forth. Cardano. Cardano we already talked about, but Cardano is basically the same thing as Ethereum, but it's it's a better computer that's hooked up to that ledger. It's a smarter computer. It's, you know, if Ethereum is the Windows 98 hooked up to that internet, Cardano is like the Mac hooked up to that internet, where it's more sophisticated, more capable, much more functional. But Ethereum already has a ton of projects that are that are already functional. It's, it's, it's already being used with a lot of projects. Cardano has tons of projects that are working on it, but they still haven't built a lot of the those uses on that on this this new internet called Cardano. So it's basically another virtual machine and another way of doing the internet that's do, trying to do many things better than Ethereum, but right now it hasn't materialized the way Ethereum has materialized, but it has a lot of potential. So it's like investing in the internet basically. Polkadot is another internet. It's uh it's a little bit more it, it's able to communicate cross chains much better. They have their own kind of benefits, but it's another way of doing the internet. So Ethereum, Cardano, Polkadot, Solana, they are ways of doing the internet, but better. Okay? They're like they're, they're programmable platforms, basically. Uh, another one is XRP, also known as Ripple. So when you're thinking about transacting value and actually doing transactions, the way banks and, and the banking system in general does cross-border and cross and international transfers is by using something called an on-demand liquidity pool. It's going to get a little complicated. Stick with me. When you want to spend, send some money from one country to another, this basically what the bank does is they add 
the money into an on-demand liquidity pool. So to say, hey, we've confirmed that Sim just put $1,000 into this pool. Please release $1,000 from the other side. And that's a little simplification, but you can think about it like that. It's a bunch of money sitting in the middle so that you, you can put in money from one side and ex extract money from the other side. And that simplifies that whole verification process of making sure that the right amount of money is added in there. Now, the systems that are used for that process have an up to 7% error rate. So if you're putting in $1,000, they could lose $70 and just say, oops, you know, and they're expensive. If you try to send money internationally, you know it takes days and days. It's expensive. It's slow. It's outdated. What Ripple and XRP do, what XRP, the token does, is it provides that on-demand liquidity pool in the middle. It actually transacts the value in five seconds rather than five days. It has a 100% success rate, so it never messes up the transaction because, remember, it's running on that ledger that's run by everybody, and we can all verify the, the validity of the transaction. So it, it can't just mess up and accidentally lose it because there's a million different miners who are effectively checking the transaction. And... It has a huge potential for usage. Now, it does have a lawsuit against it from the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, because the Security Exchange Commission that uh, says that they actually released XRP and it might be a security. So a security is like stocks or it, it has to be registered as a security in order for them to be able to sell it. And they, they're saying that they did it illegally. So right now, XRP is a high-risk investment. Um, do with it as you wish. Now, I'm going to speed through a few of the rest, a few of the rest of them. So uh, another one that's that's really hot right now is Theta. Theta is um, a way for it's it's effectively using the blockchain to be able to stream video. So you can. You can stream video to all different places. Um, it can be used for streaming. It is being used for streaming sports. Uh, there's going to be other fundamental use cases, but the idea is you use that same blockchain, basically a computer that's hooked up to that blockchain that allows you to be able to stream video. Simple as that. Chainlink. This is one of my one of my favorites in this whole cycle this time around. Chainlink is something called an oracle. So what? When you're talking about these computers, these computers that are hooked up to a, a ledger or that, that, that piece of paper that we talked about, and those computers need to be told what to do, if that requires data, like for example, if I say, when, it, when the temperature hits 26 degrees, pay my friend to bring me a blanket. Just let's say that's just a random use case. Now, that computer needs to know when the, when the temperature hits 26 degrees. You need somebody to take the take the real world data that's the temperature gauge showing 26 degrees and translate it into a language that that computer understands because computers understand one, ones and zeros they don't understand the idea of temperature. So Chainlink is an oracle that takes real world data and it feeds it into many of these blockchains. So when Ethereum needs real world data. They take it from Chainlink, and Chainlink translates into the language of Ethereum. When any of these other blockchains require data, Chainlink is the biggest provider of that data, where it takes that data, converts it into a language that they understand, and, and inserts it into the blockchain. So it's connected to many, many, many different blockchains. So as an investment, for me, it seemed like a really good choice, because when something's involved in the functionality of many different functions, then that lends itself to, that leads me to, to know that, that it's going to be more valuable because its value is tied to the value of many, many different industries, many, many different use cases. Another one that I, I love to talk about is VeChain. Some, it's something completely different from the ones we've talked about before where, you know, so if, if Chainlink is data and Theta is streaming, and XRP is banking, and Cardano, Polkadot, and Ethereum are internets, and Binance is a, a, an exchange asset-backed coin, and Bitcoin is digital gold. VeChain is something completely different. It's a supply chain tracking system. 
So the world is run on different supply chains. Everything that we that we use today has a supply chain behind it, where each one of the pieces necessary to build it was mined somewhere and built somewhere and shipped somewhere and created somewhere and put together with the other pieces somewhere, and then that product was shipped to you. So that's the whole supply chain. And VeChain allows companies to be able to track that whole process and actually be able to manage it, make it more efficient, guarantee authenticity. There's a lot of functionalities that VeChain provides, and it's actually, it, I, I feel like it, it does have a lot of potential this time around. Solana, we've already talked about. It's kind of like Ethereum and and um, Cardano and Polkadot. Now, just a few more that, that I wanted to mention are so as far as decentralized finance, there, there are a few players that have really become unique or stood out in the, in the crowd in, in uh, decentralized finance. Because remember, decentralized finance is one of the hottest topics this time around. It is going to get a lot of the funding this time around. Um, one of the biggest ones is Aave, A-A-V-E, Aave. It's a lending protocol where it allows users to be able to borrow or lend their assets at interest rates. So you can either earn an interest rate or you can pay an interest rate and borrow some money so you can do whatever you like with it. Lending in the banking world is a very useful practice and it's worth a lot of money and Aave is services that need and adds that value to society. Good one to take a look at. Uh, an NFT player is called Chili's. They've actually figured out a way to monetize and crowdsource for sports teams. So remember we talked about soccer clubs that are offering their users or their fans a way of buying a token so that they can participate in the decision making of the team. So in that way they're crowdsourcing the money from all of their fans. That's what Chili's does. Chili's allows Chili's is what what those teams are using to be able to create these tokens which give you a specific user right and you can use that to be able to make decisions and that's the use case and the fundamental that Chili's provides. So now just a couple more that I wanted to really mention that that I find really interesting is Synthetics. Synthetics is my favorite. It so when we were talking about how, you know, stocks have this many trillion, real estate has this many trillion, and then we said derivatives have more than all the money, all the stocks, all the real estate, all the bonds, everything combined is in derivatives. You probably don't know what derivatives are. You probably don't know what derivatives are, right? I got to I got to pronounce it right. You probably don't know what derivatives are. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but if you look at it, derivatives, effectively derivatives are bets that somebody's making on the price of something going up or going down. That's how you can think about it simply. But derivatives carry a thousand trillion dollars of, of value in the world, where that, they're worth more than stocks and bonds and everything combined. And this, this chain, uh, blockchain coin called Synthetics services that use case. So if we're going back to fundamental principles and thinking, I want to invest in things that add the most amount of value or at least have the most amount of monetary energy behind them, synthetics is one of those things where, for me, it made a lot of sense to look in this direction because if, if derivatives carry the most amount of value, then synthetics will carry a large amount of value eventually. And then the last one that I want to mention is called basic attention token. What it does is it monetizes attention. This is a weird one. This one really gets into the weeds. Like, what? Like, it's a, it's attention? It's storing attention? Yeah, well, look into it. But it's basically a way, because think about it. Your attention is very valuable. You, Facebook wants your attention. Google wants your attention. Your phone wants your attention. Everybody wants your attention. Your girlfriend wants your attention. You know, your attention matters a lot. And those companies monetize your attention. When you pay attention, they send you ads and they make money. So your attention is a very valuable thing. So basic attention token has a browser. It's connected to a browser called Brave Browser. And they're figuring out a way to actually pay you every time you look at an ad. But if you give your attention to an ad, then they should be paying you for that attention. That makes a lot of sense, right? I, would, I would like that. Every time you show me an ad, you better pay me. And then on the other side, you, uh, the, the ad, ad, advertising agencies can actually pay 
to get your attention. So, you know, that's where this attention piece comes in. Something really interesting I thought about. And I guess one more, one more. I'm sorry. I said I was, was going to be last one. One more I want to mention to you is one called Ravencoin. So right now, it's not just that the world is being turned into bit. It's not just that money is being turned into Bitcoin. It's not just that, you know, stocks are being turned into bit into cryptocurrencies and, and assets. It's not that just that derivatives are being done. Now, real assets are going to start being turned into cryptocurrencies. Because, like, right now, if you want to buy a resort here in Bali, you can. It's like a couple million dollars for you to buy a resort. But what if I told you... I'm going to break that resort up into little tokens that are worth a dollar each. I'm releasing two million of them. And when instead of one person buying the entire resort, you can buy as many of these one dollar tokens as you like. And that's how much of a piece of this resort you'll own. Now, that opens up the entire real estate world to you. That opens up. Somebody does that with gold. Somebody does that with houses and hotels and cars and whatever assets exist in the world you can break them up into these little tokens worth a small amount of money and people can buy each one of those tokens rather than buying the whole thing and that's the process of tokenization if you hear about that that's going to be something that's heating up more and more and, and, and it's going to become uh, the, the regular way of doing a lot of things but tokenization is this idea of taking assets breaking it up into token allowing you to buy the token rather than buying that thing yourself. Ravencoin services that functionality. That's a great use case for the world. So hopefully now we've given you a, an understanding of like, why are these things valuable? They're not just coins. They're not just mythical, random things to just make money from and blindly put your money in and hope to God you get, you get a Lambo out of them. They're actually fundamental technologies that serve use cases the same way, you know, Airbnb services is a use case, so it's valuable. Uber services is a use case, that's why it's valuable. Apple, Google service is a use case, that's why they're valuable. All of these, each one of these cryptocurrencies services a use case. And, and adds value to society and does something society wants done, that's why they're valuable. So coming for, so whenever you're, move, you're, you're going to be investing in something, make sure you understand that use case. Make sure you understand the value it's adding to society. That'll really help you understand how much value you should put on that functionality. Okay? And of course, there's, there's 9,000 more to go through if you really want to look at them it gets a little overwhelming so make sure you pick the things that you really resonate with that really resonate with your your belief systems your your outlook on the world um, don't get too bogged down in trying to learn everything you can't that's called uh, analysis paralysis and remember a lot of them are scams not these not these top ones because these top ones have a lot of tried and tested They've been tested, but they've, they've been tried by a lot of people. They have a lot of fundamentals behind them, and they've been there for a long time. But when you, once you go down into the lower few thousand of the cryptocurrencies that, are, that exist out of the 9,000 that exist today, a lot of them are just there to take your money and be scams, and they won't be around. So with that, I'll wrap up uh, this, this introduction into different cryptos. And next time, we'll be talking about entering the crypto world and what that looks like and how to do it in a way so you can be confident and not make the mistakes that most people make and the, to make, again in the end to not lose your hard-earned money and be able to keep that purchasing power and the and the monetary energy that you have thank you so much for giving me your time and your and your attention monetize your attention um, and i'll see you next time take care thanks <laughs>